bir belgesel izleyeceğiz. IPI ve e, Agit'in ortak e, yaptığı bir belgesel. E, Türkçe altyazılar olacak. Onu izledikten sonra e, belgeselin yönetmeni Javier Luque Martinez, aynı zamanda IPI'dan e, dijital iletişim e, müdürümüz ve de e, Şeyla Yusufovic ile Agit'ten Medya Özgürlüğü Temsilcisi Ofisi'nden e, temsilcimizle bir kısa e, soru cevap yapacağız. Okay, I'm going to start speaking English now. So first, I would like to have my uh, panelists here to set, set, sit down, please. Uh, so uh, I'll actually introduce them in the in meantime. I hope you liked it, first of all. Um, when, like, this is my second time watching this documentary, and it should have been more, actually. Um, but I realized how relevant it's still, because it, it was shot, shot in 2000. 18, and it's such a relevant topic, such a relevant documentary, and so powerful to see that it, I'm not a journalist, but as a woman, it gave me courage. I hope it, it feels the same for you all. Okay. Um, well, my name is Renan Akyavash. I am the International Press Institute Turkey Program Coordinator, um, working with IPI since 2017, I guess. And uh, right to my, uh, next to my right, Right to my next, I don't know, <laughs> uh, is Javier Luque Martinez. Um, he is the head of our digital communications at IPI and also the director of this documentary. Uh, and then uh, on the right is uh, Sheila Yusufovic, uh, who is the representative uh, from the um, Freedom of Media representative of Freedom of Media Office in the OSCE, which is the or organizational security and uh, cooperation in Europe. Yeah, for security. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry. Like seeing the Turkish one and trying to explain oh, okay. the English is a bit difficult. So, welcome. Um, and we will have a very brief uh, Q&A session if you guys like, but I also wanted to give the floor first to Javier about uh, asking, we'll start with asking that. Um, first of all, what was the idea behind this whole documentary and how, how did you find the, like, what was the main purpose and how do you find uh, the, the solution out of it, basically? Mm. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the invite. And, um, and uh, yeah, well, basically, I also want to say that uh, this documentary was only made possible uh, uh, thanks to the support of the OSCE, of the Organization for the Security and Cooperation of, of, uh, in Europe. Yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> got it. Uh, no, but it's, it's, it's true. I think that uh, at the time, uh, before 2018, um, I had been working uh, already for the Softjo project, for the safety of female journalists online project, uh, for two years. Yeah? yeah? Yes. It works now. But anyhow. So um, I had been working already for, for two years uh, with uh, Jennifer Adams, whom you've, you've seen in the, in the movie. And, and uh, we had filmed several um, interviews already with women journalists. Those are the faces that you saw at the end in black and white. Like many of them, we couldn't actually put them in the final product. There were more than 40 something interviews. So um, we, we decided at some point that, um, that there was enough material and not that many long documentaries talking about this issue at the time, right? Now, thankfully, there are many more, you know, that you can have access to and, and listen to and watch, right? The main purpose at the time, to, uh, well, when, when I say at the time, it's like it was premi uh, premiered on December 2018. It's so interesting how even today, not only because this is an, an, an IPI, you know, OSCE event, but also, like uh, last week, it was uh, screened in Argentina as well. So the main purpose, and to answer your question, of this documentary was, was to, from, from, from uh, my perspective, was first of all to show that this is an issue that happens everywhere in the world, but that the consequences and the impact, the emotional impact on the women journalists, it's completely different uh, depending on whether you are in a country that institutions, that you feel that institutions support you and whether uh, rather than if you are in a country where you feel that institutions does not support you, you know, that actually are in some cases behind some of these attacks. That's why, for example, in that very last, there's, there's two very specific clips 
that actually guided the whole structure of the documentary, like many countries, many interviewees, right, many things. One of them is uh, when the Russian professor said, you know, I knew that this was happening in places like Russia, like Turkey, like Serbia, you know, like more regressive environments, you know, for journalists. But what I didn't know is that the data is exactly the same in uh, France, in the UK, and in the US. And then we changed to UK, US, etc. So the, and, and, and then the second clip, it's at the very end, when Laura Kunzberg from BBC says to the journalist, to the student, say, yes, this is an option for you, you will be supported, you know, we will, we will have your back. And then we go directly to Maria Vucic in Serbia, saying, no, I don't feel supported. So these are the two clips that actually define the purpose of this documentary, right? Um, I mean, from, from my perspective, from the editorial aspect of it. And then I will, I will leave it here because I, I really want to hear your, your, your opinion and, and questions and everything. I would really love to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier. Um, now you can hear me, right? Okay. Um, now then I will actually, yeah, I already have a lot of questions, but I hope you guys have too. Uh, I will move to Sheila and actually, yeah, this is, this movie, this documentary is a collaboration uh, between OSCE and IPI and uh, both organizations have did, have done immense uh, work on the online harassment against female journalists. In that sense, IPI has a newsrooms protocol to um, give some, uh, you know, suggestions and measures for the newsrooms to tackle uh, online harassment uh, in general, but also specifically for women journalists. But on the other hand, uh, OAC has also a guideline and this whole project is basically a part of the safety of uh, female journalists online, soft job, right? Um, so I just wanted to ask you what soft job is and um, What's, what was this project about and how did, how did you come here to get this documentary and what's the, what's the essence of this project? Thank you, Renan. I will try to be as brief as Javier. <laughs> First of all, thank you for this opportunity to be here and uh, have this important uh, image screened. Um, as the title says, it's a dark place, and, uh, but I hope that it will be also as inspirational for many of you. And uh, I would also like to just point that I'm quite pleased to see um, a lot of young faces here, I guess you're mostly students, and uh, that you're still uh, believing in this profession. And I hope that this won't really discourage you from continuing, but actually inspire you to uh, complete your studies and uh, get involved in this important uh, profession, which uh, we as the Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media, which is part of the OSC, the Organization for Security and Cooperation, which was founded in the mid-1970s and uh, is uh, the world's largest uh, regional security co uh, organization, is uh, based on a comprehensive um, concept of security, meaning that it uh, encompasses three core uh, areas, or as we call them, the dimensions. Um, we have the political military dimension, um, we have the uh, economic and environmental, and then the human dimension where our office is as we believe that media freedom is an is a important pillar for democracies and for uh, basically um, achieving our basic human rights, which are the freedom of expression and the right to information. And uh, now, just going back to the project itself, as Javier just mentioned a bit of its history, but the project started, at least our office was engaged in 2015. Um, so it's been a while now, and it's uh, becoming a trend. It's not a new phenomenon, I think. With this uh, technology, of course, year by year is being used more and more, and then we see the exposure uh, to um, if the, let's say the negative impact that it has uh, on media freedom. It brings with it opportunities, but also challenges, as we saw. So the uh, trends are increasing, unfortunately, and uh, across the globe, um, the most recent studies uh, done uh, indicate that 80% of journalists, female journalists, uh, experience some uh, form of uh, gender-based violence online. And um, there was uh, just a study, a big uh, study done by UNESCO last uh, year and was published together with uh, uh, ICFJ, um, which uh, said that 73 uh, respondents in the study said from the female journalist community that uh, they have been also uh, targeted online. Uh, through different forms of uh, harassment. So this is um, an important um, aspect of safety of journalists. Uh, the office has been engaged in promoting and advocating uh, 
uh, better uh, safety conditions for journalists, but we know that female journalists have this uh, double burden, uh, not only for being uh, journalists, but also for their gender. And in some other areas or contexts, they even uh, face other uh, burdens, maybe of their ethnic background or other, uh, let's say, um, uh, intersectional um, perspectives. It could be their uh, also, as I said, ethnic background or their uh, age group or uh, other categories. So uh, this is a very, let's say, um, serious uh, issue that we are trying to address. And uh, the product of this project, after several aware awareness raising events and uh, panel discussions and conferences throughout the years, uh, we've produced a very comprehensive resource guide, which we have here. And uh, I see that there are only two copies left. I'm sorry we could not bring so many, but there were some here. And uh, we also have here also a fact sheet on the project. So basically the resource guide um, looks um, to provide concrete um, proposed proposals or, um, to different actors, including uh, specifically 10 stakeholders involving not only state actors, but also non-state actors. So also for educational institutions, uh, the media and uh, the government, the, the executive, the law enforcement, judiciary, so all of these actors who have a role to play. So it's not only when we look at ensuring security, it is the, the state's obligation, but ever, there are also other actors that play an important role. And uh, I'm sure that it was discussed earlier today also, that I think the role of probably the online, uh, the internet intermediaries. Um, so here you have a copy, but uh, please feel free to visit our website. If you just type SoftJo OAC, you will see the website pop out and you can find uh, an electronic version. For now, we have it only in English, the electronic version. Here you have some copies, as I said, fact sheets in Turkish, so please feel free to uh, have a look at it. And um, so um, now the phase is uh, to look into the more of the addressing the implementation gap. So. Uh, what have the states have done so far? Also, another thing I wanted to just mention, maybe for some of you who don't know the organization itself, it is a, uh, as I said, the world's largest regional security organization, but it's a political organization. And uh, composed of 57 uh, states, participating states as we call them, and Turkey is, one, is a participating state uh, as well. And uh, the agreements that are brought in this uh, organization are based on consensus. So everybody, so all the agreements are voluntarily uh, agreed upon, and uh, one of the important commitments, as we call them, these agreements, was uh, adopted in 2018, specifically on the safety of journalists. And here, it, why is it important? Because all of these countries uh, acknowledged the distinct risks faced by female journalists. So uh, this is another uh, aspect that we're going to now, uh, in the next phase of the project, is to look how we can um, address this gap, so um, also looking at the context applicability of the of these uh, action points because these are not context specific. So these are more like for everybody that can be applied in all contexts. But now we want to look uh, more into the context specific. And um, as part of this initiative, we had, um, and I will stop here, we had just recently a very good uh, uh, focus group discussion in Istanbul just a month ago with, uh, together with IPI and uh, where we looked into the role of the internet intermediaries on how to ensure the safety of female journalists. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just to uh, continue with my questions, I just wanted to remind, if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. I'm happy to take uh, while we talk, and I'm going to say this in Turkish just in case. Eğer sorunuz olursa Türkçe'de sorabilirsiniz. Ben memnuniyetle çeviririm. Um, okay, continuing. My um, next question will be about actually when you mentioned the difference between US, UK, and some other, you know, Western countries, so to say, and how um, the, the conditions are quite different than in Russia, Turkey. And then I want to kind of bind, like, connect this to the, uh, your work, your research, and also the online uh, project and, uh, and our newsrooms protocol. First, what, what are the measures that you can, like, can you please briefly mention what are the measures that you can actually give uh, to, to newsrooms? And specifically, are there any differences, different measures that these different countries with different conditions can, you know, uh, implement? So, um, well, uh, basically, the, the the main the main problem when when uh, talking with newsrooms about how they can protect uh, their staff, but also the freelancers 
that they work with not only their staff but also freelancers. I insist in this, <laughs> um, is the fact that uh, newsrooms in a more progressive environments, they have access to better support mechanisms from the government than those newsrooms working in a less progressive, let's put it mildly, you know, uh, uh, environments. Uh, that the support systems, the financing that they can go and approach, you know, it's um, uh, from state funds, for example, it's completely different, especially in those countries where uh, state funds are mainly used to manipulate and to, and to buy the, you know, uh, the editorial lines of, of, um, of, of uh, newspapers, basically, of uh, media organizations. So there's, there's, there's a huge difference there. Um, our, our work uh, right now, it's, it's, and first of all, we talk about newsrooms because IPI, it's a global press freedom organization and our members are uh, news media, right? News organizations. But also because uh, newsrooms are often the first line of defense in progressive environment and the only line of defense in regressive environment together with of course the journalist associations and not in every single country because in several countries um, um, the, the journalist organizations are just also a branch of, of the government as well. Um, thankfully this, this is not the, the case here. And. Um, so uh, our, our work, it's basically on training uh, newsrooms on how to implement, you know, mainly uh, a set of measures that the idea is to, for the women journalists, you know, to feel safe when reporting about online harassment. And I'm talking about, about this because, or, sorry, I mentioned about women journalists specifically as well, it's because uh, not only data show, but throughout all the interviews, the viciousness of the attacks against women journalists are, are way beyond anything that we can imagine. The thing is that many, many of them, actually what they do is it's, it's they, 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 work up, they wake up every single morning and still report and still work on, on these issues, despite, you know, having threats against their family and against their kids, etc. So. Um, one, one of the main issues is that many of the journalists, and I'm sure that, that also a lot of journalists here as well, is that online harassment is, is a new norm, you know. If you're a journalist, you have to accept that it comes with the job, that you're going to be harassed, that you're going to be insulted, that you're going to be threatened. It comes with the job. Well, yes, it does, unfortunately, but the second part of the of this sentence is, yes, it comes with the job, and no, it shouldn't come with the job. You know, so we need to do something. And the idea is to create, you know, the environment in the newsroom where journalists go and report. Because what happens in many newsrooms, we visited over 45 newsrooms across Europe, is that um, most of the journalists, they don't report because they either don't feel like encouraged to do so because they think that they're going to be stigmatized. You know, they're going to be lesser of a journalist, you know, if they do so. Or just because, you know, the newsroom is still, um, how do you say, dominated by a macho, you know, vibe, a macho environment. So that's why we wanted to focus on, on this. And now we're shifting the, our work, as, uh, sorry, we're not shifting, we're opening a new uh, strain, let's put it this way, which is investigating online coordinated attacks. I think that uh, this is very important and this is the second aspect as well that in the documentary we wanted to show together with the OSCE is that yes, this online harassment, this phenomenon actually is very, you know, targets viciously, you know, predominantly women journalists, but the impact, it's not only on them, you know, the impact is on all of us that we cannot have access to the sort of information that these journalists will be able to produce, right? So our work is to try to investigate, you know, coordinated attacks to see who is behind and what's their purpose, why they want to silence and to intimidate, you know, women journalists. And what's the narrative, what's their political agenda, what's their economic agenda. So we want to partner with social network analysts, scientists, basically, investigative journalists, you know, to try to understand who is behind 
how these attacks happened. You have already seen an example, social network, you know, these, these networks, these bullet points, you know, connecting and so on. This is a real case from Turkey. I didn't mention it here. But that belongs to uh, an online coordinated attack against Jada Karan. Um, famous Jada Karan. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, that's, that's basically, so this is uh, the work that we want to start doing that. And yeah, I'll stop here. No, it's, it's amazing actually because um, uh, when you tell me, like tell us about the, you know, this, this work, two things comes up out of this. I th to me, what I understand as a result is that um, this is, yeah, this is, a, this is not a new issue. This is everywhere. Women journalists and journalists in general are, are being targeted online and offline everywhere. But there are two, two problems as I see it. One is that um, normalization or inter internali internalizing this, this problem, that it comes with the profession itself, is problematic and second is there are no there, the, the lack of lack of mechanisms to report on these issues is a problem in the newsrooms right or in in uh, state institutions which is a higher level or higher uh, problem to think about which where I want I want to come to Sheila now because when uh, she mentioned about this um, focus group work we did in uh, a month ago uh, in Istanbul is that and when you say also OSC is a political uh, organization I know that you you guys gather this information and of course present this with the member states and then how do you see this soft uh, resource guys guide can be used to um, you know, make things better for women journalists, exactly, or what, what OSC does in that sense. How, how can we really benefit from this work? Thank you, very good uh, point. Uh, yes, the OSC is a political organization, but it does not mean that uh, it does not have uh, any use or any power because in the end uh, it is based by consensus and the participating states uh, voluntarily decide to be members and also pledge to um, follow through the uh, commitments that they all agreed upon. Yes, this is in a way some kind of uh, soft law, but uh, it is still useful and it is complementary to also international human rights law. Um, the representative on freedom of the media uh, has a, uh, an important function um, because currently it's a woman, so I will address her as uh, she, um, has the mandate to um, follow media freedom developments uh, directly with the, the civil society in the media, but also with the participating states. So she has direct contacts with the participating states. So this is an important, I think, leverage uh, when, when you look at the work of an international organization. Uh, often we are called as the also we ourselves call as the inter intergovernmental watchdog, and indeed it is like this. Um, so um, her role is important because, as I said, the direct communications with the governments uh, is an important tool, and it is effective. Now, it's of course up to the states to decide, are they going to uh, commit to those principles and to move forward, or to go uh, backwards, but uh, we see a general decline, unfortunately, in media freedom across the OSCE region, so uh, not just specifically in a certain country, but it is a more uh, a sad trend that is occurring in the past years. Uh, we've seen it, especially in the times of crisis, like the COVID pandemic has shown how governments can be authoritative um, to clamp down on uh, freedom of expression, critical voices particularly, and uh, also with uh, other uh, public interest uh, events. Um, so uh, using this platform with the direct contacts, but also uh, having uh, different uh, platforms for dialogue involving the states, but together with the, uh, the civil society and the media. For instance, we have uh, regional conferences that we organize now every two years, um, Southeast Europe and uh, Central uh, Asia and the, and the Caucasus before, uh, but um, also raising awareness uh, events that we've done so far since 2015. So bringing together different stakeholders. So this is important to bring people together at the table. This is a starting point for every kind of improvement if you want. Uh, you need dialogue. We cannot do it on our own. We need a multi-stakeholder approach where everybody is involved. And uh, this uh, resource guide, I think it's a perfect example of identifying who are the main actors when it comes to safety. This is not only, of course, relevant for 
female journalists, it's for all journalists, but it is a bit more specific for the female journalists, but can be used, of course, for uh, even male and uh, all, uh, let's say, other uh, journalists, uh, how they identify themselves. And uh, so these are the platforms that the representative has and the tools. Uh, and uh, just to refer quickly to what Javier mentioned about uh, the safety, the online safety, it is a threat not only to their psychological well-being uh, and also their ability to report, but if they are silenced by these attacks because of also the fear of spilling uh, in the offline sphere, there's really nothing so virtual about them. They're very real, these threats, as you've seen it here. Uh, it is a threat to pluralism. So you will have uh, uh, less uh, different opinions and voices, and also in the, uh, in the newsrooms. It also affects you know, the level of diversity. So it is a combination of things. You know, it's about you know, gender equality. Yes, it's a safety of journalists. It's about our media pluralism. So it has different layers and aspects to it. So it, let's say that the impact is really grand. Thank you so much. I want to turn to the audience if anybody has any questions or I already have a lot of mine so I can continue. But any questions? Um, please, over there. Thank you very much. Uh, this was uh, one of the most impressive documentaries I have ever uh, seen in journalism field. So I would like to congratulate you. And uh, I, w I was wondering your personal feelings as a male journalist and a researcher when you were interviewing uh, these female journalists. That's, that's a very good question. And um, yeah, I, I, I was, um, I was um, humbled, like um, honestly overwhelmed most, in most of the cases. Uh, and in in some of the cases, I ended up uh, being speechless, honestly. Um, and and also, um, what I what I learned is is um, among many 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 things. But um, one of the things that really, from a personal perspective, not as a representative of IPI, but it kind of enrages me the fact that. Um, women are women journalists are left to do an heroic act in order to do their work you know they are forced to be heroes you know all the time in order to sit down to wake up in the morning grab a coffee sit down and start you know typing that's why for example one of my uh, obsessions in the in the documentary was to film making coffee you know because this is something that I think that a lot of us can actually relate to in the morning, right? And, uh, and to bring this feeling, you know, of these day-to-day uh, -day things to an audience, to a male audience, who cannot immediately relate to what some they, they, they are going through. So by giving these signals, you know, to with the coffee, with the last images, you know, in black and white of them looking directly at the camera, like calling the attention of the, of the audience, using these storytelling, you know, techniques. What I was trying is to also bring the, atten the attention of those who do not relate uh, directly to the, because they are not women, you know, or they don't feel like in the gender spectrum, right? Um, to, to be able to, to feel it somehow to feel close to it. Um, yeah, a, a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any other questions? Um, actually, when you mentioned that journalists, like the, when you mentioned that the women journalists are left with the, like to, to be, be the hero, or like they are being forced to be the, be, be the hero, is something that we also heard this morning in one of the panels. I don't know, maybe some of you remember that when um, a panelist was saying that journalists in general are uh, forced to be, yeah, superheroes. And then also gave a, a like, a they made a joke about like, Superman actually was a journalist, but this is not, yeah, but this is not how it should be. Not, not like, not journalists can be superheroes all the time. But uh, unfortunately, in repressive environments like ours, in, in many, many countries, in Serbia and everywhere, in Russia, journalists are left with this option only. And everybody's forcing themselves to do something with this threat 
on like on their back of their hand head all the time trying to keep doing what they're doing so it's it's very very difficult but it's it should it should not you know discourage anybody here and i think what we are trying to do is that despite all the all these threats online threats and physical threats uh, to to women journalists and all that um, they didn't give up i think that's the main message um maybe like closely to the end i just wanted to uh, ask about firstly what's the impact of this whole documentary or how do you see the impact of this uh, project? How can we, that's what I wanted to also ask, like how can we really utilize this work to make things better for journalists, uh, journalists' lives, women's journalists' lives? And what do you, do you have any plans to, you know, maintain this type of work at OSC? Uh, what are your, you know, future plans for, for this kind of work? Thank you, Rena, for this question. Uh, for now, I don't know if we have any plans to produce another documentary, but I honestly, I hope that we won't have the need to. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, since it was uh, launched, I believe in 2018, that time I was not with the office, um, four years have passed and uh, it has been uh, the priority of the office of the OSC representative on freedom of the media to um, spread this, screen this documentary uh, across uh, the OSC, but also more uh, widely. So uh, basically raising awareness again through this image and uh, on the impact of and the importance of safeguarding journalism, first of all, as a important uh, function in a democratic society, and, uh, but also to understand the underlying um, and distinct risks that the jour female journalists are facing. So throughout the years, the documentary has been screened in several uh, OSC participating states, as I said, and we had different panel discussions. So there's a lot of, it shows that there is a lot of, let's say now, more better understanding and um, of this uh, issue. And I think there's still work to be done. So it's not something that we are uh, stopping uh, for now. And coming here also to uh, Izmir, I know that last year the documentary was screened in Istanbul, so that is the aim of the project to make as many screenings as possible, not only in one location in our country, but across. Uh, so we hope that we will continue in other parts of uh, the country, but also uh, beyond. And uh, to measure the impact, it takes some time to measure the impact, as you may uh, know, but I think that with this, at least now there is a better understanding, as I said, of this uh, problem. And there are initiatives now uh, to uh, address this. For instance, um, through uh, national action plans, that is what, what it, we as an office are also uh, trying to uh, advocate for. For instance, currently in the OIC there is the UN, uh, sorry, uh, in the UK there is a national action plan and uh, in several, some participating states there are some national mechanisms that are dealing with particularly not only for female journalists but for the safety of journalists, all journalists, uh, but I think there's still more work to be done to um, integrate this gender responsive approach in the uh, response mechanisms of the institutions themselves and uh, not only I think in the um, in the national institutions, but also, for instance, the education institutions. Like in your uh, syllabus, I'm, I'm not sure if you are also covering any aspects of safety of journalists, and I think it's important to integrate that and gender equality again, so basically raising awareness, and it will continue. Thank you, and Javier? No. Same question for you. <laughs> Um, well, the impact, yeah, as uh, Sheila says, it's, it's actually difficult to, to analyze this impact in, te in terms of numbers. What we know is that since we started doing trainings in newsrooms, um, um, I would say in more than half of the newsrooms that, that we have trained, um, at least we, they have adopted one, two, three key measures, you know, that, that little by little changes the culture inside inside the newsroom um, yeah I think that that uh, that probably that the most important you know uh, impact is what um, Sheila was was saying is, is the fact that that people realize that this is uh, an issue mm -hmm. it was really important back then 2018 19 when when um, only you know 
a bunch of, of, of people. I mean, it, it was already a big issue, but, but now after the pandemic with the Ukraine and Russia war and so on, they have all these two major events, the COVID-19 pandemic and the war have accelerated trends, you know, that what I was saying before, these organized, coordinated campaigns, right? Which, to be honest, um, one of the ultimate goals, it's not only to intimidate the journalists, but also to plant a seed of doubt in the audience of these independent, you know, journalists. Because, you know, if they lose, you know, some of the audience, they also lose subscriptions. And they lose um, impact. They lose impact, exactly. And, and, and this has also a whole economic sphere, since we are, like, since, since the whole, you know, uh, topic about this session is, uh, this conference is, it's about new media um, and, and economic sustainability. It, it really has a huge impact. Did you see in the presentation from the, from the guy from uh, 444 in Hungary, like one of the main threats to their journalists were smear campaigns, disinformation, online harassment, you know. That is, you know, one of the main issues that they have. And it has an economic impact because if uh, people, so if these campaigns to discredit the messenger are successful, then uh, people stop their subscription, you know, or it's more difficult for independent journalists whose survival relies heavily and significantly on you know these subscriptions, the support from their communities. If they lose part of the support, their work it's cornered, and their narrative, the public discourse from propaganda, uh, the, the the narrative from from populism, you know, takes over. So there is actually you know this kind of war about words, you know, about information, about narrative. And, and we all need to be aware that, that, the, that the, the targets, it's not only the women journalists, are not only the media, you know, but it, it's also all of us. It, it's really all of us. Well, thank you. And actually, um, maybe I can also, like, finally, because in the um, documentary also, one of the um, journalists in Spain was mentioning that the, when, um, she got directly targeted by one of the politicians, for example, she was fired, right? And this type of attacks we see in Turkey a lot, we see really everywhere, basically. Um, but also, yeah, you, you underlined something very, very crucial, which is now the new media we are talking about is online. Everything will, is online now, and all these threats are online, but they're actual threats. So. Everything they face there can actually happen in, in you know, can follow up, follow, can be followed by a physical um, attack or action. So this is this is something real. And the first thing to do is maybe not to normalize these and all of the all of the journalists and female journalists to to fight against this or newsrooms to take actions and measures to fight against tackle this this problem is one thing. Um, I think. It's pretty much all from my side, but I don't know if you have any questions. Otherwise, I would like to thank our uh, panelists. It was um, a great honor to have you both, but also it's great to see the documentary. I hope you all liked it. And really thank you for uh, attending all of our sessions throughout the day. I hope you liked it. Um, thank you. <laughs>